Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba Hey there, all you crazy cats and critters out there, and welcome to our review of TV, that's television, for those of you who were born after the year 2010, in 1992, which was a long time ago in a galaxy far away. Hey, I'm Michael. Hey, I'm Carson Daly. I mean, I'm Ramin. I'm Molly. I'm Erica. Johnny Carson hosted The Tonight Show for the last time in 1992, which also meant that Jay Leno debuted as the host in 92. Johnny Carson's last show, I was watching a clip from it recently because he had Bette Midler and she sang one for my baby and one more for the road and Johnny was crying and it was really cute. Isn't Johnny Carson's last show what they were making fun of on The Simpsons when they did Krusty the Clown? They did his like final show and they had like him singing Send in the Clowns and stuff. I like crying. Also in 1992 were the first MTV Movie Awards. It's not just music anymore. <laughs> it's, the, it's the beginning of the end. Also in 92, Snick debuted on Nickelodeon. Woohoo, Big Orange Couch. I remember that. We're going to take one night that's not going to be Nick at night. It was Saturday night. So all you kids that didn't have anything better to do than watch TV on a Saturday night could watch Are You Afraid of the Dark and get your pants scared off you. On an episode of SNL in 92, Sinead O'Connor ripped up a picture of Pope John Paul II. And by a picture of Pope John Paul II, you mean her career. She talked about that, actually, and she said that she didn't ruin her career. She made it so the record execs couldn't get another yacht. Her career was really fine. She just wasn't a huge millionaire after that. What a badass thing to say. And she was right, so... <laughs> Please, in no way, shape, or form do I disagree with what she did. I'm not yeah. saying that at all. It's crazy how controversial that moment was, because I feel like if somebody did something like that today, it would, people would just roll their eyes. Are You Afraid of the Dark is a 10 out of 10 for me. I loved scary stories and mysteries when I was a kid, and this consistently delivered. I was 10 years old in 1992, so as often as I could stay up until 9.30 or 10 p.m., I would. I didn't watch Are You Afraid of the Dark at all, because I have never been into horror. But I think it's super commendable, given all the secondhand accounts I've heard, that they were able to make a kid's show scary, but stay within the, for this time, very harsh boundaries of censorship. Anybody can make a gore porn scary movie. Can I say porn on YouTube? I don't know. But anyone can make a gory movie super scary with just blood and guts. That's easy. There's no limitations. But like, I feel like in a kid's format is hard. If you think about the R.L. Stein novels, it was a way of storytelling that kept the gore and some of the adult themes out of it, but still brought in the, the mystery and, you know, ghost stories, things like that. Those translate well for children. So that was a lot of it, but it did also introduce some difficult things like how do you deal with the death of a child and how do you talk about why his ghost came back and haunted his big brother? I feel like Michael's on Are You Afraid of the Dark right now? Yeah, I'm... He's about to submit something for the Midnight <laughs> Society and, like, throw the sand on the ashes. <laughs> not not the best light in here. I loved Are You Afraid of the Dark. I always found the horror genre sort of tantalizing, and even though I knew that it was not for me, but, like, I thought it was cool, like, cool people were into it, so I wanted to be into it. Actually, what haunts me, like, to this day from Are You Afraid of the Dark was, like, the opening credits. Do you guys remember? Oh, yeah. It's the playground, and there's the swing set with the one one swing that's moving back and forth with that creaking sound and the other one is still I like cannot walk by a playground at night <laughs> without thinking of that lots of people have a moment like that for my sister it was when the hand comes up with the match and then it gets blown out at the end those kids they would go into the woods and like sit around a campfire and tell these stories and I was always like Are you just going into the woods at night without a grown-up I thought that was like way cool Though I was too old for Barney, my mom didn't think I was. And when I was waiting for the bus in the morning, while my mom like wasn't completely awake yet, she'd turn on Barney and I'd be listening to like, I love you <laughs> and so on. Or clean up, clean up. I was wondering if somebody was going to sing the song. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> I was really looking forward to that. I was definitely the target demographic for this because I was four in 92. I loved Barney. I remember distinctly the point at which in my grade school years, I realized Barney was no longer cool to like because all the other kids would like sing, you know, mean made up versions of the songs with like horrible lyrics. 
and I realized like, oh, I'm not allowed to like this anymore. Okay. But Barney is good kids TV. I think it's the best version of Batman aside from the comics. I love the noir art direction of the show. I love the voice talent. Kevin Conroy is the perfect Batman. Having Mark Hamill as Joker is incredible. And it also had some really excellent writing, including things like they invented Harley Quinn for the TV show. Mr. Freeze was a comic villain before this, but they really fleshed out his character on the animated series. And I think that episode won an Emmy. That's often held up as one of the better examples of voice acting in all of animation as well, because you talked about Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy and some of the others. Having not been a, a Batman girl myself, I didn't watch it. And, and that's one of the ones I think on my list that I would go back and watch the whole thing now. I am also not a Batman girl. And I didn't really watch this regularly, but whenever I watched it, I remembered enjoying it. I agree in completely on everything you said, especially the art direction. It's hard to think of many other animated series at the time that got this dark aesthetic right without going too far. And that is another one of my things I love about this version of Batman. I think Batman can either be like hyper camp, right? Or hyper dark. Like it's either the Dark Knight or the 1960s show. This one I thought struck a good balance. It was not campy. Like you, you couldn't really call this show campy, at least that I remember. It had its moments, but usually those moments would then turn dark again. One reason I've always disliked Batman is I don't find his character relatable at all. And this is one of the only versions of Batman that I do find relatable. I'm kind of tempted to light all these candles behind me and make it look like I'm in a ContraPoints video. Which I never really watched a lot of, but I always thought it was a ripoff of Bill Nye, but no, Bill Nye came later. Somebody was dressed like a rat. I can't remember much about it though. And he had weird hair. I feel like it was weirder than Bill Nye. Like Bill Nye was like whimsical, but like Beekman's world was like bizarre. Zany. Oh yes. yeah, I remember this. Yeah, I never watched this, but I remember seeing it and thinking that looks a little strange. That was kind of kids TV of the time period, right? The precedent was set by some of the Nickelodeon shows like you can't do that on television. Going into the 90s, it just got weird. And like Michael said, zany. If I turn the light on my computer all the way up, I get more light on myself. <laughs> yeah, and your glasses are glowing. <laughs> yeah. I loved Lamb Chop when I was growing up. That woman was talented. First of all, people don't appreciate puppets anymore, but I loved this show. I thought it was amazing all the things she could do and the characters were charming. But when I rewatch it, and I don't very often, but when I do, it's a little creepy. And maybe it's just the fact that it's puppets. Maybe when I say people don't like puppets anymore, I'm the problem. The song. Don't start it, because <laughs> then it won't end. <laughs> this is the song that never ends. It's a good song. Oh, no, no, there goes Ramin for the rest of the night. But yeah, no, Sherry was super talented. I loved her. And you were saying the characters, uh, Lamb Chop, obviously, but Hush Puppy and Charlie Horse were great. It did feel like a show that had been around forever. Sort of like the song that never ends. Like, it's just like this eternal loop forever. <laughs> which starred Paul Reiser and Helen Hunt. I remember it's a show that my mom watched, but I don't remember a whole lot about it. But I do remember there was a big deal about one particular episode several years into its runtime, where it was an entire single take episode. It was after the two of them had had a baby and they were making the baby sleep through the night without going to get it. And so they were just like sitting outside the baby's door, uh, the closed door while it, while the baby was crying. And they were just like, feeling really bad, but like, no, we got to let him cry himself to sleep. So like you're saying it was like the first like gimmick episode of a sitcom, basically? Probably not. Or it was just the way they filmed it for like art reasons. Other gimmicks like that, I'm sure had been done before. I don't know about that specific gimmick. Yeah, I do remember as being like a show that my parents watched and, and the Helen Hunt of it all. Like, remember when Helen Hunt was a huge star? Like what happened to Helen Hunt? Ah! Talk about the beginning of the end. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the first unscripted reality television show, like of like, we're going to put people in a house and film them. I can't think of anybody having ever done that before. There wasn't even like a prize or anything. It was just like, we're just going to like bring these people from disparate walks of life together. And it was great television. <laughs> I, you know, I would still watch The Real World today if they started a new one. Although I don't know, maybe it would be trashy nowadays, like the Jersey Shore of it all.
And I'm also wondering if I went back and watched these older seasons, if I would feel the way about them now that I did when I was a teen. Weren't the early real worlds like less quote unquote trashy to use mm-hmm. Molly's word? I think it's always going to be a little trashy. Like I seem to remember they there was more like serious discussion around things like the AIDS crisis, for instance, in the first couple seasons. Yeah, there was a character, was it the first season or the second season? Or not a character, a person, an actual person who was HIV positive and that was like kind of radical for the time. Most of the real worlds I watched were the later seasons because I was four and nobody was going to let me watch this. I just remember whenever I would watch it, all these moments when they would be like, so and so is about to sleep with such and such. And then the camera would like follow them into their bedroom. And you were expecting this like steamy, not for TV thing. And all it was was like the covers sometimes coming up, maybe a little smooching. Like it was, it was so tame. Yeah, it was <laughs> television after all. They couldn't just like show actual people doing it. It was filmed in this like documentary style. Like I think the difference between the real world and like similar shows today is that nowadays you have a lot more of like even though it's technically unscripted you have a lot more of like producers going in and like manipulating people and 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 shaping the arc of a story whereas back then they were they were literally just like putting the camera on people i mean i think i think there was some manipulation but like it was not like it is now where where it's almost they're almost feeding them lies <laughs> a very important part of the SNCC lineup because we talked about SNCC premiering in this time. The reason I always stand up for Roundhouse is because it was just truly a brilliant show and it's one that almost nobody has heard of. Even people who religiously watched SNCC or Nickelodeon in general, it was a sketch comedy show. It premiered in 1992 on my birthday. All of the cast were like these big quadruple hits. Every single one of them could dance, act, thing. Some of them were playing instruments. They had a band that was on stage. And what they would do is stage it around the sort of microcosm of the modern nuclear family. They had a guy who regularly played the dad and the mom. And then they they created these sketch moments of just brilliant comedy. Like the, the acting was fantastic. The dance choreography was wonderful. The music was always thrilling and they had a they had a really good band playing with them and it just had a theme and a lot of elements to it that were very edgy but funny. They had a lot of audience participation. You're not alone. I remember Roundhouse. It was probably only on for a couple of seasons, right? Because three, three years. The mass market audience was not ready for a show like that. And I think it was later replaced in the SNCC lineup with All That. Do you guys remember All That? They I was going to ask, how is it like All and, That? Yeah. Yeah. And Keenan and Cal. But before that, it was Roundhouse and it was much artier. Like All yeah. That was much funnier and Roundhouse was much artier. The earliest lineups for SNCC were really geared more toward teenagers. And that's where Roundhouse fit in really well. Because you get into like all that and Keenan and Kel were stepping down into preteens and older kids. And that's good. They were great. They were wonderful. But Roundhouse and like Ren and Stimpy, like really early Ren and Stimpy was all very raunchy. You had Are You Afraid of the Dark? That was definitely for like teenagers preteens at best and roundhouse fit into that paradigm now i'm a little older for the sort of snick generation but i was 10 at the time and i just found it to be very artistic and forward thinking and and just very very fun but also a better idea of kind of how i wanted my teenage years to look sailor moon is a pivotal part of my childhood, adulthood, and inevitable elderly years. Sailor Moon was huge in bringing anime to the U.S. If you had to name two anime that made anime in the West a thing, it's DBZ, Dragon Ball Z, and it's Sailor Moon. And I loved and still love Sailor Moon because it is a series started by a woman for women. I love Sailor Moon because all of the the most important characters are female. The only time men quote unquote save the women, they are often called out for being mostly useless. And most importantly, Sailor Moon and her friends gain their power from their femininity. What is it they use to transform? makeup kits and putting their nails on. What is it that they gain their power from? Twirling around a lot for no apparent reason. And that's 
the point. I also love that Sailor Moon didn't shy away from some tough topics. I mean, there is no special Sailor Moon episode about caffeine pills or, you know, sex education or what have you. But there are many episodes about typical, like, teen angst things, like, you know, not being able to make friends or being picked on for being a nerd or, or being picked on for being a tomboy. I love that all the characters do not feel, and this is really makes it un this makes it unique among animated shows the characters don't feel like caricatures or flat characters they are all really well developed characters sailor jupiter is a tomboy who's tall but she also likes to cook and clean sailor mars is a shinto priestess but also a huge bitch and is like not shy about what a bitch she is and could, would probably tell you that herself i was also a big fan of sailor moon uh when it started airing in the u.s i think what i loved was how the lead sailor moon uh, what was what was the like when she wasn't sailor moon like what was her name serena serena that's right in Serena English was yeah. like so <laughs> relatable she was like so normal right she was like boy obsessed couldn't wake up in the morning to get to school on time you know was constantly like late was a mess her room was always a mess like she was always like struggling <laughs> and I loved that about her because it was like she was she was a st on the struggle bus but she was also like a friggin superhero <laughs> and Ramina and I have talked about this before in a completely unrelated video about how yeah there's the big bad of every season that they have to deal with but also one of the main arcs of every season is that she has to get her shit together and she does by the end of the season and then like there's usually some sort of mind wipe and they start all over again Ramin was talking about the happy things at the end of that first season season it gets really heavy and I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it missed opportunity I should have worn it today my but you didn't do anything t-shirt when people thought of the anime at first they thought of like Dragon Ball Z right or Gundam or like all these in Japan they're literally called shonen anime which means boy anime anime for boys but Sailor Moon did, I, I think also did a great job of like straddling that gender line because I knew people of every gender expression who liked Sailor Moon now it was more popular with, you know, women and queer people, but I still knew plenty of straight guys who liked Sailor Moon. It was the one show that I rushed home from school so that I could watch. I loved X-Men so much. It even got me into collecting comics for a very brief amount of time, but all X-Men comics, I both had a crush on and wanted to be Gambit. But I also want to talk about how this show was surprisingly adult for a, a kid's cartoon show. In the very first episode, one of the heroes dies permanently, does not come back. This show doesn't hide how it's a metaphor for civil rights. It's like a very, very thinly veiled metaphor for civil rights, the whole show, and how politicians get involved in that. And it's all self-serving and how it messes with people's lives in ways that it shouldn't just because of other people's prejudice. I have a story, and I don't know if you want to include it in the video, but I've held this story within my breast for many a moon, and it's time that the world knows about my friend, Brian. So when I was a kid, like all children were into X-Men, pretty much. Brian and I were among those children. And Brian had a really fascinating talent for stretching the truth just enough that it still seemed like it could be true. And Brian and I, when we would play X-Men, he would just take these kind of adult romantic storylines and like step by step take it too far to the point where finally I was like, I don't know. Because, you know, one of the big themes in the show was the love triangle between Wolverine and Jean and Cyclops. Brian, when he and I would play, he would be pretending he was Cyclops and he's like, yes, I am going to uh, look at me like voicing Brian at age <laughs> eight, like he's freaking Christian Bale. I am going to take Jean with me and we are going to kiss and then Wolverine will get mad and then we will start to take our clothes off. And like, it would be at this point, like, yeah, that face. It would be at this point where I'd be like, did they do that? And I think in some tiny part of my like second grade brain, I knew that Ryan and I were not the same, <laughs> but I couldn't verbalize 
why it was that Brian was so into the idea of Jean Grey's boobs, and I, I was not. I guess I'll just echo that I also loved the X-Men because of the way it felt so adult and it felt like it didn't talk down to you. I felt like when I was watching the X-Men, even though it was a animated cartoon that was marketed toward children and I was a child, it (laughs) felt like I was watching a very sophisticated adult, almost soap opera right and i was so into it and how dark it would get like the phoenix saga like i remember like when the phoenix saga was happening like that was like unmissable television like i have to get home to see the stunning thrilling conclusion of the phoenix saga what ramin was saying about his friend being obsessed with gene i was with you with that but i was also strangely obsessed with emma frost and psylocke but for like different reasons for like the like diva worship reasons. <laughs> All I have to say is, Brian, wherever you are, I hope you're happy and happily wed to a woman who looks just like Jean Grey. <laughs> what is CBS Sunday movie? I've preloaded that one. There was a movie that they played on CBS every Sunday in the evening. And this particular year, one of the movies was really popular and push it into the top 10 Nielsen ratings for the year. My parents like to inform me that before Blockbuster and movie rentals, if you wanted to watch a movie that wasn't in the theaters, you had to wait for somebody to air it on television. Now, Full House premiered in what, 1990? You know what? I already called everyone's attention to it, so I might as well guess it. Full House. Full House was number 10. Oh, wow. I was expecting better. Okay. Erica. Home Improvement. Home Improvement was number three. Erica gets eight points. Molly. Roseanne. Roseanne. Rosanna, Rosanna, Dana. Was number two. Molly gets nine points. Mm. You took my fucking guess. Um, <laughs> Wasn't great. I seem to remember this being popular in previous years. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. Number one. Ramin got it. Oh. Nice. Don't call it a comeback. <laughs> number one was a news program? Uh huh. Can you imagine in twenty twenty four? Power of grandparents. <laughs> Erica, what you think? Rescue nine one one. Rescue nine one one was not one of the top ten. Erica's first error. Molly. Got to be Cheers. Cheers was the other number eight. Three points for Molly. What you think, Ramin? How about some Monday Night Football? Monday Night yes. Football was number seven. Ramin gets four points. Straits every time. Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Fresh Prince was not one of the top. Ah, uh, boo. Molly. I'm gonna go with. Uh, okay. Uh, there's two I'm trying to decide between. They're both contenders. They're both very much like shows my mom watched. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna. Mm-hmm, let's go with Murphy Brown. Murphy Brown was number four. Seven Hot points for Molly. Hot dog. Take that damn quail. <laughs> That was going to be my guess. Um, Murder, She Wrote? Murder, She Wrote was number five. Wow, okay. Damn. Erica. That that was going to be my next one. Can you pick the last one? Mm -hmm. Coach. That's it. (sighs) And I would have guessed. Yeah, because Michael wouldn't have included it if it weren't in the top 10, right? (laughs) It's it's also been on the top 10 in like the last few times we've done this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and almost all of the ones that are left are new shows from this year. Or Um, children's TV. Yeah, right. None of the children's shows are going to be, yeah. 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 Okay, so any thoughts about TV in 92? Very 1992. (laughs) One of the things that I was noticing when I was going through is like, I didn't recognize basically anything that was not a children's show. And stuff from years before this, I still recognized, even if I didn't watch it. It seems like this was just a big year for children's television because I didn't recognize as many children's shows from previous years. Oh, there's my cat. Yep. (laughs) I'm <laughs> posing perfectly. Yep. <laughs> he's, he's been meowing at me. He wants to play, I think. And I will recede into the darkness. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for watching. Give this video a like if you liked it. Give it a pity like if you didn't like it. If you wanted to drop any trivia or anything that 
you wanted to say about any of these shows or any other shows from 1992 that I didn't write down because I didn't know what they were. Write it in the comments below. We'd love to chat with you about that or read what you have to say. To this side is a video that YouTube thinks you might like, so check that out. Up there in the corner is the link to our channel where you can subscribe to us. We put out usually once a week videos about media, mostly video games and music, but occasionally other videos like this, like TV. And that's about it. Maintain your groovy selves. Yeah.